Virgin Most Powerful Radio, sharing the gospel with clarity and charity. And now, Virgin Most Powerful Radio is pleased to present Hands-On Apologetics with renowned Catholic author and apologist, Gary Machuda. Hey, welcome everyone. Yes, we are back. And we are going to talk apologetics. You have entered into the Virgin Most Powerful's Apologetics uh, Dojo. I'm Gary Machuda, your sensei and host, and uh, welcome everyone. It's great to uh, be back and talk about explaining, defending the faith, and who other that would be the, the first person on your mind when you want to talk about getting into the trenches, rolling up your sleeves, and sharing the faith. Well, none other than the blue-collar apologist himself, John Martinoni, is going to come into the dojo today. And uh, we're going to talk about something uh, I, I've been meaning to talk to him about for a while, and that is his, uh, uh, you know, he uh, has a ministry called the Bible Christian Society, and they have a periodic news, newsletter that comes out. I'm not sure exactly whether it's monthly or uh, bi-weekly or something. It's it's called Apologetics for the Masses. And in this uh, newsletter, he's debating an evangelical pastor. So I wanted to uh, kind of get a give you a ringside seat into this uh, match between uh, the blue collar apologist and uh, this pastor and kind of, you know, pick John's mind about explaining defending the faith in the format of a debate uh, format. So uh, John's going to come on the show. Also, we're going to do our Finding the Fallacy for today, which is the appeal to spite. And we're going to meet the early church father, St. John Christostom, who is a very, very important church father. Uh, lots of great apologetics material. Uh, so, you know, everyone who defends the faith ought to know who St. John Christostom is and, of course, his writings. And you are part of the program. So, uh, when, especially when John comes on, feel free. Give us a call toll-free at 888-526-2151. That's 888-526-2151. Love to hear from you. Or you can always send your questions here at questions at handsonapologetics.com, which comes straight into the dojo mailbox. Love to hear from you as well. And it's also time for us to give our shout-outs for those uh, watching live on social media, uh, Facebook and YouTube. Hello, everyone. Greetings. Ah, Beth, love the explosion of emojis. Yes, good morning to you. It's great. Get all these good morning sensei uh, greetings. It really does liven up your day. <laughs> I wish you could experience it. And I'd also like to thank all of you listening live on radio th across the country and also via our podcast uh, which is found on Virgin Most Powerful Radio dot org website. Um, thank you so much for listening to the show. Hope you're enjoying it. And uh, why don't we jump into our critical thinking exercise for today? And that is our Finding the Fallacy segment, which concerns the appeal to spite. Okay, the appeal to spite. Uh, here's a definition: the appeal to spite is a fallacy which someone attempts to win favor. For an argument by exploiting existing feelings of bitterness in spite about the opposing party. So in other words, what they want to do is they want to sway the audience emotionally by associating uh, the speakers or their opposition's arguments with uh, some group or people that is disliked or even hated uh, by the audience. And this is, a, unfortunately, a very common fallacy uh, in the area of apologetics. Because uh, one way to, not only apologetics, by the way, but also politics and just social media and that, the best way to win an argument is to label somebody uh, or associate somebody's position with a, a group that is odious to the public. And, of course, this is a fallacious argument. Why? Because... You're moving away from evidence-based argument and instead trying to manipulate the feelings of the audience. 
Uh, and uh, so, you know, it's, it's very much akin to a propaganda technique known as guilt by association. Uh, it's funny, there, there are, uh, you know, uh, propaganda techniques and, and fallacies kind of have their, their uh, family resemblance in some ways. And so, uh, you know, this is very, uh, very common, I said, in apologetics, for example, people could throw out terms like Inquisition or the Crusades or something like that, and uh, therefore kind of paint their opposition in light of uh, something that people have a negative understanding about. So that's our finding of the fallacy for today, the appeal to spite. You might say, wow, that was a real quick segment. Well, that's because... Our Meet the Early Church Father today, his bio is quite long, so God willing, I'll be able to squeeze it in before the break. Our Meet the Early Church Father today is St. John Chrysostom, who lived or, or roughly around uh, 344, 354, and died in A.D. 407. Uh, some people say that he's, uh, his writings are unparalleled amongst the writings of the early church fathers. Others compare him to St. Augustine. But quite frankly, both of them are, are quite unique writers and uh, kind of deserve their own fame in their own right. Uh, he, like I said, he was born, we're not really sure exactly when the date was, somewhere between 344 354. He's a native of Antioch, which was the first place in which Christians were called Christians. Uh, he studied philosophy and rhetoric under the celebrated pagan uh, teacher, Lebanus, and uh he also formed in that school a lifelong friendship with another early church father, Theodore of Nopsiwestia. When John was 18 years of age, he met uh, Meletius, who was the bishop of Antioch, who baptized him, and he became basically a constant companion of the bishop. And in spite of, in spite of his mother begging him to remain home with her because she's a widow, uh, John instead sought solitude in the ascetical life in Antioch, in which he spent four years living as a hermit, or living with a hermit, excuse me, and eventually moved out into his own cave, uh, where he remained for two years in solitude. It was during this period where he never laid down to sleep, night or day, that uh, he it, it, uh, caused his gastrointestinal system to, to not properly function. Plus, the cold and the dampness uh, also affected his kidneys. So, uh, since he was unable to care for the physical ailments in solitude, John returned back to society, in which in 381 AD he was ordained a deacon, and in 386 he became a, a priest, and was assigned for uh, 12 years to preach in the main church in Antioch. And this, by the way, is where John really gets his fame for being a magnificent preacher. In fact, the word Christostom isn't his last name. It's a word that means golden mouth. It's kind of a title. So it's John Golden Mouth. Um, in 397, the Emperor Arcadius brought John to the capital in Constantinople on February 26, 398. And John was unwilling recipient of the Episcopal consecration. And uh, not only did John not want to be bishop, but the person who was ordaining him didn't want John to be bishop. And that is our, our uh, I guess you could say, villain Theophilus of Alexandria. Now, as Metropolitan of Constantinople, John immediately set about to reform the clergy and laity. Uh, it was a very happy period of his life. Uh, however, uh, you know, he reformed uh, through his preaching. Uh, the clergy uh, spoke against scandals and so on. Uh, however, in this, uh, this period, which is incredibly fruitful, in which we have lots of homilies from, uh, it also uh, caused them to have a lot of enemies at the same time. So in uh, 401 AD, uh, he deposed six bishops as guilty of simony. And as a result, along with the court, which he also roundly criticized uh, because of its luxury and depravity, uh, basically all the forces against John began to be united. And once again, Theophilus of Alexandria is caught up into the fray. Uh, he had resented John ever since he was forced to consecrate him as Bishop of Constantinople. And Theophilus's uh, dislike of John 
turned into act of hatred where he became uh, he came personally to Constantinople in 402 to answer charges brought against him by a bunch of monks that uh, Theophilus had uh, exiled from Egypt because they were following the originist heresy. So John brings up charges against Theophilus. Theophilus now becomes the bitter enemy of John. And uh, in turn, uh, Theophilus called 36 bishops, all enemies of Christosom, and most of them Egyptians, to have a, a synod on the outskirts of Chalcedon, which is the celebrated the yoke. And at the Synod of Yoke, the synod condemned John Christostom on 39 charges. John three times refused to appear in his defense, and he was declared deposed. So the emperor kicks John out into exile, but immediately riots began with the people, and there was also an earthquake, which uh, the very next day the emperor recalled John back to, John, to Constantinople. So you got to love John Christostom. And, in fact, not only does he come back, but he comes back amidst cheering crowds and uh, with the embrace of the crown. So for a few months, there was this uneasy peace between the emperor and John. Uh, unfortunately, the empress, uh, Theodoxia, decided to uh, erect a silver statue in front of John's church of herself. And all the celebration and noise caused John to, in a homily, uh, more or less go after the empress. Uh, some reports say that he likened her to Herodias, you know, the woman who asked for John the Baptist head on a platter. Uh, this unfortunately broke the peace. And as you can imagine, uh, the emperor asked or ordered John to retire. He refused. Uh, he ordered him to stop practicing the priesthood. He wouldn't. Eventually he gets banished and uh, on his way to banishment in September 14, 407 AD, John dies. So that's the early, Meet the Early Church Father for today, John Christostom. On the other side of the break, fasten your seatbelts, everybody. The Blue Collar Apologist is going to join us. John Martino, stay tuned. This is Terry Barber inviting you, all the men, to a men's conference June 15th at the Sacred Heart Chapel. This is going to be a day where we're going to talk about true masculinity. You know, there's a problem in the Catholic Church today. We have very few men who love the Catholic faith. And I know a lot of the wives that I'm listening to right now are saying, I want my husband to be on fire for the faith. Send him to the men's conference. Your son, send him to the men's conference by going to virginmostpowerfulradio.org or call 877-526-2151. That's June 15th. When your husband comes back from this conference or your son, they're going to have a different view about their Catholic faith because they're going to meet three men who love Jesus and his bride, the church, and are going to instill in them a love for Christ and his church, the Eucharist, Our Lady. Bring them to virginmostpowerfulradio.org. Sign up there or call 877-526-2151. Full sheen ahead. It is only because of your continued prayers and generous donations that Virgin Most Powerful Radio can broadcast live each weekday. We count on your spiritual and financial support because you understand the urgent need for Catholic programming that shares the gospel with clarity and charity, but without compromise. Please prayerfully consider becoming a monthly donor. You can set it up with the touch of a button on our website, catholicrc.org. Buying or selling your home or your business property? This is Terry Barber. Real Estate for Life underwrites The Terry and Jesse Show. And they can connect you to one of 900 pro-life real estate agents around the world. And when they receive their referral fee, they will give 80% of it to a pro-life organization. Wow! That's 80%. Realestateforlife.org, 877-LIFE-US-1. Now, back to Hands-On Apologetics with Gary Machuda. 
If you'd like to join the conversation, call 888-526-2151. Here's Gary. And welcome everybody to Hands-On Apologetics. I am Gary Machida and uh, I want to talk about debating Catholicism and what better person to talk about Getting into the trenches, getting your hands dirty in apologetics, then the blue-collar apologist himself, John Martinoni. John was born Catholic, but never learned the faith growing up, and left the church, then went off to college, where he received a, BA, a BS in finance and then an MBA at the University of Alabama. He's the host of EWTN Open Line. He's also the director of the Office of the New Evangelization in the Diocese of Birmingham, and, of course, the president of the Bible Christian Society. Society. Uh, you can get a hold of all of John's great stuff at www.biblechristiansociety.com. That's all one word, biblechristiansociety.com. And John Marnoni, welcome to Hands on Apologetics. Gary, good to be back in the dojo. Yes, yes, it's great to have you back as well. I know you've been super busy, so we appreciate you making time. Uh, oh, John, it's you know, there's. My pleasure. Oh, yeah. Well, hey, there's something I've always wanted to talk to you about. Uh, we've been doing topics and things like that. But, you know, uh, the Bible Christian Society also puts out an uh, email blast every now and then called Apologetics for the Masses. Can you tell us a little bit about that? Yeah, Apologetics for the Masses uh, started, I guess it's been about 15 years, when I was out on my own doing blue collar, uh, doing the Bible Christian Society, going around giving talks, sending out, uh, at the time, well, around the turn of the century, uh, cassette tapes, and then CDs, and now CDs, and MP3 downloads, and all that good stuff. What happened is people would start emailing me questions. Well, and, and, you know, someone could say, send me a question that, yeah, it took them 20 seconds to type up. And it might take me three hours with the research, the typing, the, all this stuff to right. answer them. And, and so I, w I was starting to get 5, 10, 15, 20, 25, 30, 40 questions a week. And there were some days where I was spending eight, nine hours just answering questions. And I loved it, but the problem was is those people were just expecting me to do it for free. You know, uh, and every every now and, and when I would send back and say, "Hey, could you make a donation to the Bible Christian Society?" Sometimes people would actually get upset and say, "How dare you ask for money to do the Lord's work?" And I'm like, you "Gotta read your Bible. The the workman is worth his wage." You know, uh, and, and don't right. muzzle the ox when it's treading the grain. So I couldn't earn a living just answering questions. So I said, "Well, I'll just do this newsletter." I'll come up with a newsletter, and I'll put a question in the newsletter, and that way I'll answer these questions that a lot of people undoubtedly have, except I only need to do it once, and I'll send it out to everybody. Well, it started with, I don't know, maybe I had a word of mouth, everything, maybe a couple hundred folks, the first newsletter I sent out. and I tried to send them out every other week, but it, it averages about 20, 25 a year, so every other or, or every third week and it just kept growing and growing word of mouth all word of mouth and now 15 years later i'm coming up on my 350th uh, issue and they're all archived on my website on the newsletter page of biblechristiansociety.com so anybody can go back and read any of them and um and we're up to almost uh, 39,000 subscribers in all 50 states and at least 80 countries that I know of. So it's just, it's it's gone crazy, absolutely crazy. That's great. Well, I mean, they're, they're great. Um, they're packed with lots of info, and, you know, they're presented with the same panache that uh, you present on the air. So I can see why uh, it kind of went viral, at least, as far as uh, a newsletter is concerned. Yeah, I just, I basically everything I do is just, it's very simple, it, and it's got to be logical. It has, there has to be a logic to it, an internal logic, an external logic. It has to make sense. And so everything I do, whether on the radio, uh, giving talks in, live in person, or through the newsletter, 
it's just it's a lot of it is just plain old common sense, Gary, and, and, and simple logic, common sense, and oh yeah, well, let's let's throw in the Bible as well, you know? Yeah, yeah. Well, you know, like they say, common sense isn't that common anymore. Uh, no, it's so, not. <laughs> <laughs> now, uh, with the the questions with the newsletter, are they all Catholics, or do you get non-Catholics sometimes throwing questions at you? Oh, I have. Uh, it's generally the questions that I answer are from Catholics. What happens, though, is a lot of Catholics uh, have put their non-Catholic family members or friends, they've signed them up. You know, I, I don't ever okay. sign anybody up. I, I don't like it when people do that to me. Uh, I don't do it to anybody. But there are people out there who, hey, my cousin would be good to listen to what this guy's saying or read what this guy's saying. And, and so people sign. So I've got a lot of non-Catholics on there and they'll contact me every so often say hey thank you i'm learning about catholic faith i'm considering it i'm a methodist minister or or, or uh, uh you know anglican priest or something along those lines and um and but what happens is i'll get a number of them who are anti-catholic and they're just they're reading what i do so that they can find what's wrong with it and they'll shoot me emails saying, you were wrong on this, you were wrong on that. And, it, and I might pay attention to them, I might not. But every now and then I'll just pick one out and i say, okay, he sent me an email after each of the last 12 issues. So I'll, I'll say, all right, how would you like to have a conversation? Uh, you, you start it off and I'll publish it in the newsletter. And you can evangelize to 39,000 Catholics, mostly Catholics. And they go, oh, yeah, I love it. And then uh, that's when we have our dialogues. So I've had uh, dialogues, or you could call them written debates or arguments, whatever, um, with I don't know how many Baptist ministers, evangelical pastors, uh, uh, Messianic Jewish ministers, all, all across the spectrum. Um, and, and those are the ones that, you know, we get into these dialogues, and that's where I sh really show the Catholics, okay, this is how you deal with people who are, answer who are asking you questions about your faith or even attacking your faith. They say this, this is how you respond, you know, or, or here's a strategy for how to handle this, and, and here's a strategy for how... Because I, I don't just give them the Bible verses and say, this Bible verse takes care of that. I say, this is the thought behind why I'm telling you to do this, why I'm telling you to ask this question, because I want them to make it their own. I don't want it, they're mimicking John Martinoni's strategy. No, they're taking John Martinoni's strategy, and they're making it their own so that they can use it in their everyday life in a way that makes sense to them and that they can easily remember. That, that's the thing I get. The thing I like most or, or what I consider the biggest compliment I ever get is when people will say something like, uh, John, you know, we love all these other apologists out there that, you know, uh, I won't mention names, but you know, the highbrow folks who, who, you know, just they know 20 times more than what I know. They say we love them, we love listening to them, but we can't do what they do. But we can do what you do. And I go, excellent. That's, that's, that's a huge compliment. Yeah, and that's why we love you here in the dojo, because, you know, it's hands-on apologetics. It's uh, getting you know, your, your, uh, yourself dirty, you know, being in the trenches, dealing with uh, different objections. And uh, I, I love your methodology. And you're right. I think probably the, the clearest recipe for disaster is to just repeat somebody else's arguments without making them their own. Yeah, yeah. Because if you don't understand it, then the first question you get, all of a sudden now your argument doesn't seem to be much of an argument. Because, uh, you know, yes, this verse, uh, verse whatever on, you know, Romans 2 something something shows that Mary was not, what was indeed uh, uh, sinless her entire life. Oh, really? Well, how about this? this it? Uh, uh, if you don't understand the argument, if you don't make it your own, then you're gonna run in, you will probably run into problems when you start using it.
Right. Yeah. So when you get an argument, folks, you know, look at it from the other person's perspective. Kind of ask questions about it. What What about this? What about that? Maybe this isn't true if this is true, you know, and kind of uh, roll around your head and formulate it in your, the way that you would say, you know, how you would put it. But don't simply repeat, because trust me, I don't know about you, John, but I know early on I used to steal, quote unquote, a bunch of arguments from Scott Hahn. And it, I thought they were pretty effective. But the problem is, is once people start asking questions, I was totally lost. Yeah. Yeah. And that's what I tell people. I said, you know, all the stuff, a lot of the stuff that I know, I learned from listening to Scott Hahn. He's like uh, my mentor in apologetics. Okay, I, I I don't know how many Scott Hahn uh, apologetic CD sets or actually cassette sets and then CD sets I've owned in my lifetime, but it's a lot. But I, what I had to do is, I'm like you. At first, I just well, I'd try to repeat what he said, which is difficult to begin with. But then I'd, I'd say something he said, and if somebody asked me a question, I, well, I, I don't know. Well, I don't know why it's that way. It just is, you know. And yeah. and so I had to take what he said, and I had to kind of bring it down to my level. I, you know, I had to figure out how how do I understand this, and how can I put it into my words with the Bible and common sense, <clears throat> excuse me, and simple logic, and and make it my own. And when I did that. That's when I became more effective in being able to explain and defend the faith. Right. Yeah, and and I think the the beautiful thing about uh, your newsletter and all the stuff you do, John, is that it, it's so uh, it's so practical and kind of on the bottom level that I think it's accessible to anybody. That there really isn't a lot you have to kind of re-engineer and make your own because uh, it's like you said, it's just plain old common sense. Yeah, and I I tell people, I say, look, if you want deep theology and deep philosophy, you don't want what I do. Now, and the reason I say that is because, number one, I don't know deep theology and deep philosophy, but number two, the average Catholic doesn't need deep theology and deep philosophy in order to explain and defend their faith. Um, I tell people, I say, where, where, where Protestant beliefs differ from Catholic beliefs, those Protestant beliefs are at the surface. They are on the surface, theologically speaking. So Catholic, a Catholic understanding just a little below the surface, one, two, three, four, five feet below the surface, you, you've got a better understanding of theology than most Protestants have, or a better backing of theology for your beliefs than most Protestants do most protestants do for their particular protestant beliefs and i say now all you have to do is ask a question to try to get down underneath the surface with them and doesn't have to be deep below the surface just below the surface excellent we're talking with john martinotti and uh, on the other side break we're going to talk about dialogue he's having with the evangelical pastors so stay tuned This is Terry Barber inviting you, all the men, to a men's conference June 15th at the Sacred Heart Chapel. This is going to be a day where we're going to talk about true masculinity. You know, there's a problem in the Catholic Church today. We have very few men who love the Catholic faith. And I know a lot of the wives that I'm listening to right now are saying, I want my husband to be on fire for the faith. Send him to the men's conference. Your son, send him to the men's conference by going to virginmostpowerfulradio.org or call 877-526-2151. That's June 15th. When your husband comes back from this conference or your son, they're going to have a different view about their Catholic faith because they're going to meet three men who love Jesus and his bride, the church, and are going to instill in them a love for Christ and his church, the Eucharist, Our Lady. Bring them to virginmostpowerfulradio.org. Sign up there or call 877-526-2151. Full sheen ahead. It is only because of your continued prayers and generous donations that Virgin Most Powerful Radio can broadcast live each weekday. 
We count on your spiritual and financial support because you understand the urgent need for Catholic programming that shares the gospel with clarity and charity, but without compromise. Please prayerfully consider becoming a monthly donor. You can set it up with the touch of a button on our website, catholicrc.org. Buying or selling your home or your business property? This is Terry Barber. Real Estate for Life underwrites The Terry and Jesse Show. And they can connect you to one of 900 pro-life real estate agents around the world. And when they receive their referral fee, they will give 80% of it to a pro-life organization. Wow! That's 80%. Realestateforlife.org, 877-LIFE-US-1. This is Jesse Romero. You're listening to Hands-On Apologetics with Gary Machuda on Virgin Most Powerful Radio. And welcome back, everybody. Hands-On Apologetics. And uh, for those just tuning in, we are talking with the blue-collar apologist himself, John Martinoni, about um, actually a great resource. And, you know, uh, there there are a lot of great books, and uh, but books can get pricey. So I, if you're like me, I always try to make sure that the book I pick up is going to be something that's really useful. But there's a lot of things that are incredibly useful that's absolutely 100% free. And we're talking to John about a dialogue that he has in something that's absolutely free, and that is his newsletter. And, John, again, where can we get that newsletter? BibleChristianSociety.com. And you'll see uh, tabs across the top. You click on the Apologetics tab, and then it's the newsletter page. And like I said, I've got, I'm almost up to my 350th issue over, uh, that spans about 15, 16 plus years, and they're all there archived on the website. Very good. And how much does it cost to get the newsletter? Um, <laughs> it's uh, reasonably priced at zero yeah yeah Nothing. i love it now that's what i call my price range <laughs> yeah exactly the only the only way it could be better is if i started paying people to take it you know, which i'm not gonna do <laughs> <laughs> i've tried it it doesn't work you, you yeah people yeah. don't do it and and it costs a lot of money but uh there you, go. you know one thing uh the reason I, I bring up the newsletter is because uh right now uh, your newsletter is engaged in this dialogue with an evangelical pastor, and of course we don't want to single them out because you know we don't want to seem like we're picking on someone, but we'll just call him Pastor Greg. And uh, can you give us a little bit of background about how you got to meet Pastor Greg and how the dialogue started? Well, Pastor Greg is one of those people that I mentioned uh, in earlier in the show that uh, he got started receiving my newsletter, and I, I found out later it was a cousin of his, I think, that signed him up, a Catholic cousin, and um, after every, every so often, after every maybe every other newsletter, Pastor Greg would shoot me an email saying, you got that wrong, or you got that wrong, you know, relatively short, and he, he did it for, I don't know, better part of a year before I finally said, okay, let, let's, you know... You and I let let's have at it. Let let's have a dialogue. And I'll I'll you want you want uh, attention. I'm going to give you attention. Let's do this, but let everybody read it. And he was all about it. And I said okay. Good. So and the the first thing that he really latched on to was I had sent out a, a newsletter about the sinlessness of Mary, and he sent back a quote which I know you're familiar with from. Romans 3, and it said, um, let's see, for there is no distinction, verse 23 of Romans 3, since all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. He said, see, all have sinned, John. That includes Mary. You know? And I said, okay. So I, I came back to him, and this is what I tell everybody. When, whenever that verse is used on you, you use an earlier verse in that same chapter. Romans chapter 3, 
I ask, uh, but before you tell him you're using something from Romans, I just responded to him when he said, all have sinned, Romans 3, 23. I wrote him back, I said, well, are you seeking God? You know, and, and I've asked that question, I can't tell you how many times of Protestants who, you know, use, have used that verse, all have sinned. And I said, are you seeking God? Every one of them says, yes, I am seeking God in my life. And I, I email back, and I said, well, there's something wrong here then. Because in the Bible, in Romans 3, verse 11, just, you know, 12 verses before that verse, you, you told me all have sinned, so that includes Mary. I said, it says no one seeks for God. So no one. So if, if you're interpreting all have sinned as an absolute then no one has to be an absolute to be consistent. So either you're not seeking God in your life, and, and you just kind of told me a little fib there, or you're telling me the Bible is wrong. Which is it? And that started the dialogue. And he came back with, well, yes, all who don't believe in God are, have, uh, are not seeking. No one who believes... Well, how did he phrase it? Let me get this right. No one who is an unbeliever seeks God. <laughs> I said, you know, Pastor, it doesn't say that. You know, he added words. It says no one seeks for God, not no one who is an unbeliever seeks for God. Right. I said, if you say that all is an absolute which means Mary has to be included. Absolutely everyone who's ever lived and ever will live, except for live, except for Jesus Christ, is under the you know, the, the caption of all, then absolutely no one who has ever lived or ever will live is seeking God. It says so in the Bible. And he starts quoting other verses and everything, but I, I he can't get around it. Yeah. He cannot get it he has to change how he interprets one verse to the next verse. He has to change his method of interpretation, which, you know, he's not going to say, oh, yeah, John, I see what you're saying. I, yeah. I, right. I understand. But everybody who's reading the newsletter, Catholic and non-Catholic alike, they see it. And they say, you know, John's got a point there. You know, and I tried to tell him, I said, all is not an absolute. He says, no, all means all. I said, well, look, you know, if I said, hey, you know, if I'm talking to you, Gary, if, if Gary, you and I lived in the same town, and we hung out together, and we had a group of friends we'd generally hang out with, and, and, you know, I said, hey, went to a movie last night, and you said, well, who was there? And I say, everybody was there. Yeah. Does that mean absolutely everybody in the in the city, or maybe the state, or or everybody who lit? No, no, it doesn't mean at. It means most of the folks in our group of friends. They may not have even even been everybody in our group of friends, but I, that's just the way we talk. We're very imprecise quite often in how we use our ver our, our language, but everybody understands unless. Yeah, well, it's like, Gary, it rained cats and dogs last night. Uh, well, John, you, you saw cats and dogs falling from the sky? You know, no, it's an idiom of speech. So all, when it says all have sinned, if you read it in context, what it's talking about, it's talking about the two groups. Paul's talking to the Jews here, and he's saying, you know, sorry, Jews, but just like the Gentiles, we're sinners too. Yep. All means yeah. both groups. You know, yeah, if, it's not talking if, about individuals. In fact, and, John, and, I got an even better illustration because it's close to lunch. I always do food illustrations. <laughs> if you go good, into good. if if you go into Pizza Hut and you say, "Give me a pizza with all the items," they can either put all the the food that they have in the pantry on the pizza, right? All the items, or they could give you samplings of different items. Yes. And, yeah. So I, yeah, you know, it's close perfect. to lunch time. So I figured, hey, why not make a food analogy? <laughs> yeah, yeah, um, excellent. You know, and you're absolutely right. All it means all in one sense, but it doesn't mean all 
in an absolute sense. Right. And, and that's perfectly acceptable in terms of how we use the word in our everyday language. And, you know, because if all means absolutely everyone has sin, then no one means absolutely no one is seeking God. But I'm seeking God in my life. I assume you're seeking God in your life. People listening to this radio program are probably seeking God in their life. Yeah. You know, and all of Beautiful. we all do a, a different degree of, of, we all have a different degree of success in seeking God. You know, some of us do better than others, and, but we're seeking God. And so when it says no one seeks God, oh, well, no, it can't mean absolutely no one. Right. And what it does mean is it's actually quoting from a psalm in the Old Testament, what Psalm 14, I think. Mm-hmm. And if you go back and read that psalm, it talks about the fool says in his heart there is no God. And it talks about these people who say there is no God, but then it talks about the, the righteous people, the children of God. But it says all pertaining to the fool who says there is no God. And it's, so all doesn't mean absolutely everyone, even though in the Old Testament it says all. So you have to understand this is not an absolute, you know, and, and if you do interpret that in an absolute manner, you have to interpret everything else close by in that context in an absolute manner, but they don't. And so that's, that's where asking a simple question, are you seeking for God in your life? And the innocent answer, yes, I am. Mm, no, you're not. You can't be, because Scripture says no one is. Oh, well, what that means is X, but all still means all. <laughs> like, yeah, right. come on, Pastor, come on. Yeah. So it, it's, it's interesting, very interesting. Now, we only have maybe about a minute or so left. So you didn't pursue the point. Now, if you were in, like, a live debate, would you have pursued it? I would have said it once and then said, He's got to come up with a better way of of responding, or else I win this particular point. And then if he comes up and says something, I said, no, I've still won this point. He hasn't explained it. So I would maybe say once, but I wouldn't necessarily dwell on it. And actually, that's one reason why I don't do live debates, because you don't – so much stuff can be thrown out by one person in just 10 minutes of talking – you can't respond to all of it, and if you do try to respond to one or two things, you can't really respond to those with very much depth. That's why I so much prefer the written debates that I do in my newsletter. Yeah, very good, and uh, excellent advice, too, for uh, those who do dialogue. You know, people can throw out a million objections, and uh, you know they kind of win by default just because you don't have enough time to answer everything. We're talking with John Martinoni. About uh, web apologetics. Stay tuned. This is Terry Barber inviting you, all the men, to a men's conference June 15th at the Sacred Heart Chapel. This is going to be a day where we're going to talk about true masculinity. You know, there's a problem in the Catholic Church today. We have very few men who love the Catholic faith. And I know a lot of the wives that I'm listening to right now are saying, I want my husband to be on fire for the faith. Send him to the men's conference. Your son, send him to the men's conference by going to virginmostpowerfulradio.org or call 877-526-526. 2151. That's June 15th. When your husband comes back from this conference or your son, they're going to have a different view about their Catholic faith because they're going to meet three men who love Jesus and his bride, the church, and are going to instill in them a love for Christ and his church, the Eucharist, Our Lady. Bring them to virginmostpowerfulradio.org. Sign up there or call 877-526-2151. Full sheen ahead. It is only because of your continued prayers and generous donations 
that Virgin Most Powerful Radio can broadcast live each weekday. We count on your spiritual and financial support because you understand the urgent need for Catholic programming that shares the gospel with clarity and charity, but without compromise. Please prayerfully consider becoming a monthly donor. You can set it up with the touch of a button on our website, catholicrc.org. Buying or selling your home or your business property? This is Terry Barber. Real Estate for Life underwrites The Terry and Jesse Show. And they can connect you to one of 900 pro-life real estate agents around the world. And when they receive their referral fee, they will give 80% of it to a pro-life organization. Wow! That's 80%. Realestateforlife.org, 877-LIFE-US-1. Now, back to Hands-On Apologetics with Gary Machuda. If you'd like to join the conversation, call 888-526-2151. Here's Gary. And welcome back, everybody, Hands-On Apologetics. We are talking with the blue-collar apologist himself, John Martinoni, uh, regarding his newsletter, uh, Apologetics for the Masses, which is available free at BibleChristianSociety.com. Uh, go ahead, subscribe, and you can have these uh, great information-packed newsletters delivered free right into your mailbox online. And we're talking about uh, some of the content in these newsletters, particularly a dialogue that John's having with the evangelical pastor. We'll, we'll call him Greg. And uh, so uh, the first shot, John, was uh, from Pastor Greg was on the sinlessness of Mary. Uh, where did it go from there? Well, basically, generally I tell people, try to bring the argument around to authority. Because no matter what you're arguing, sinlessness of Mary, the assumption of Mary, purgatory, communion of saints, etc., it all comes back down to authority. Who has the authority to decide what is true doctrine and what is false doctrine? Does each individual believer reading the Bible on their own have the ability to decide for themselves? Or do we look to the church Jesus founded that's guided by the Holy Spirit to decide these things? And, you know, obviously as a Catholic, we look to the church. As a non-Catholic, most people look to their own private interpretation. So I try to tell people, bring it back to authority. But in this one, I kind of let it go, and it just it went to... Um, it, Oh, I can't even, it, it, sinlessness of Mary, and then we got into the priesthood and, and his call to be a pastor, and sola scriptura, uh, which is kind of getting around to authority because it's the church versus sola scriptura. Um, and once it got out there, I let him talk enough, to, I gave him enough rope to basically hang himself. Then I started bringing it back to authority, and I said, okay, you know, I said, Pastor, you said we go by the Word of God alone. And he said something. He said, um, the all scriptural commands that we are to obey from God, we know through the scriptures alone. Mm -hmm. And so I said, okay, if we know this through the scriptures alone, where does the scripture say what you just said? And he came back. He said, well, it says it in several places. And he gave all these verses, you know, and, and I said, well, I've read those verses, and it doesn't say what you said, that all scriptural commands we are to obey, to obey come from God through the scriptures alone. That's not it, and I put it in quotes, and I said, you, knew, you do know what quote marks mean, right? I said, I, I, there's a reason I use them, and he said, oh, well, it's in there, and, it, and then he finally came back, and he finally admitted, because I wouldn't let it go. He finally admitted, well, this is my, he didn't say opinion, but my conjecture, uh, not in the Scripture, that all scriptural commands we're to obey come from God through Scripture alone. And I, and I, I said, do you not understand the contradiction? It's not in Scripture, but you said all scriptural commands, which this is a scriptural command you're giving me, or, or a spiritual command you're giving me, 
it's not in the scripture, yet you say all spiritual commands we have to obey are in the scripture. And he, he hasn't gotten back on that one yet. Uh, you know, and he, he'll start to switch here or there, talk about something else. But it's coming back to authority. And basically what I ask him is, you know, why should I believe what you say? And he tells me, well, I just go by the scripture. I said, no, actually you don't. I said, because if you look at our dialogue, you will give me a scripture verse, and then you'll give me, I said, you'll give me the word of God, then you'll give me the word of Greg to explain the word of God to me. Very and he says, well, no, no, it's, it's scripture. I said, no, it's your words. And I said, why should I believe your words? Are your words infallible? He says, no, no man's infallible. I said, that's right. I said, so by what authority are you telling me that I should believe what you're telling me? And he can't give it. You know, he just can't give it. And that's what I tell Catholics all the time. When someone tells you you're wrong or that the Catholic Church is wrong or that you're your interpretation of Scripture, which is perfectly in line with Catholic teaching, is wrong, you ask them, by what authority are you telling me you're wrong, that I'm wrong or that the church is wrong? And they'll say, the Bible. You say, no, no, it's not the Bible. The Bible's not telling me, because I read the Bible, and the Bible's perfectly in sync with the Catholic Church and Catholic teaching. So by what authority? Well, you know, this is it. I say, and I'll ask them, where is your name in the Bible that I should believe you? Well, of course, my name's not in the Bible. Right. So tell me by what authority. And I just stay on it. I've had people tell me I'm like a bulldog, that once my jaws clamp shut, <laughs> they do not let go. You know? right. And uh, uh, so I just kept at him, kept at him, and he finally had to admit, okay, this isn't in the Bible, What something he had said, which he had said it like it was, infallibly scripture you know and then he admits well okay this is this is my opinion not the bible you know and or well okay of course this isn't in the bible exactly like that you know or i well yeah i give you scripture passages and then i explain them to him i say yes the word of greg not the word of god and slowly i see even though he's not admitting it and maybe not even realizing it but he's conceding my arguments because now he started to say, oh, well, is that the word of John or the word of God? And I'm like, yeah. uh-huh, you get it. You're right. understanding it. Yeah, that's so, my experience. That is one of the most difficult ideas to get across, especially to somebody who styles themselves as a Bible Christian, is yeah. that uh, they're completely unaware that they are, they are adding their, their own interpretive spin on the text. You know, it isn't like the text says, you know, it has a footnote and says, and if you want to understand what this means, go see reference, you know, Second Timothy, whatever, right? Right. The Bible doesn't direct us to different places. You, the human, connects the dots. Exactly. Exactly. And, I, you know, I've had people, um, well, like Romans 3.28, it says, uh, uh, well, let me get, I've got it right in front of me. It says, um, Oh, it's not Romans 3.28. It's, um, uh, let's see. Oh, yeah, 3.28. For we hold that a man is justified by faith apart from works of law. And they go, see? It says faith alone. <laughs> I said, no. <laughs> it, it doesn't say that. It says apart from works of law. Yeah, faith alone. Like, no, works of law. That's Old Testament. N- number one, they're... they're they're basically dismissing Matthew 25, which says, for I was hungry and you fed me, I was naked and you co-. They're calling those works of law. Those aren't works of law. Works of law are, are the, all the uh, uh, cleansings you have to do, the, the keeping kosher, the you know, circumcision, the animal sacrifices. Those are the works of the law, Old Testament. Not, not doing good for others, loving your neighbor. And so they don't understand that, but then... That word alone, it's not in there. And they see it when it's not there. Mm. So they see things that aren't there, and then they don't see things that are there. And, it, and like I said, it's very difficult. But what I, I tell Catholics, I said, you have to always remember this teaching, this dogma, that the, the, you know, the underpinning of 
Protestantism, sola scriptura, the Bible alone, actually is sola, my fallible interpretation of Scripture. That's what you have to remember. For every Protestant who believes sola scriptura, you have to make them see, at least try to make them see, no, no, it's, you're, you're giving me sola, your fallible interpretation, scriptura. Yeah. And yeah. when Catholics realize that, it's kind of like, oh, yeah, so no matter how much sense the other guy might make, how much he might have you confused, because, you know, he's got the Bible memorized, and, and you maybe know where Genesis is in the Bible, um, he's still giving you his opinion of what the Bible says. Catholics, that ought to free you up to to realize, I understand now what this guy is saying. Even though he can make, you might have a great debater who makes a great argument, but if he's arguing something that's contrary to what the Catholic Church teaches, the Church founded by Jesus Christ and guided by the Holy Spirit, he is wrong, and you can bank on that. Even if you can't poke a hole in his argument, I'm guaranteeing he's wrong. And there are holes that you can find if, if you had a little more knowledge. But So don't be swayed by a great debater because he is giving you his opinion, his fallible opinion. So I always tell Catholics, somebody gives you a scripture verse and they say, this proves the Catholic Church wrong, you say, amen. I believe what that scripture verse says 100%, but I don't agree with your fallible interpretation of that verse. Right. And you'll blow people's minds. Yeah, absolutely. That That's brilliant advice. I mean, absolutely. Well, John, I can't believe that. The hour has just flown. I mean, it it's seems fun. like... Yeah, as soon as you step foot in the dojo, it's like the time flies. Yes, yes. <laughs> So uh, uh, again, where can people get a hold of your newsletters and all the you know great talks that you've done and other writings? Where can they go? Uh, BibleChristianSociety.com. dot com. I said I'm coming up on 350 newsletters. I've got a whole page what I call Two Minute Apologetics, which are short question and answers. Uh, I've got 27 CDs or MP3 downloads that are free. I've also got my Blue Collar Apologetics DVDs. Um, that you have to pay for those because they're, I have to buy them from EWTN, but don't tell anybody I sell them for less than EWTN does. So you can get the blue-collar uh, DVDs there as well. So a awesome. lot of good stuff. Take advantage of it. Awesome. Well, thank you so much for coming on the show. We appreciate it. It is my pleasure as always, Gary. All right, thank you. And uh, ladies and gentlemen, that was John Martinoni. I, I love his stuff. I mean, just uh, rock solid, practical advice, and do make you know avail yourself of all the resources that he has there on uh, BibleChristianSociety.com. dot uh, com. I love it. It's free, and uh, you know, it's just more tools in your tool case to help explain, defend the faith. Coming up tomorrow, uh, we had a last-minute cancellation, so Dr. Bradford's not going to be coming on. Instead, and this is great, it's like uh, uh, having somebody, uh, Mickey Mantle, pinch hit for Babe Ruth, and we're going to have uh, Paul Thomas come back to the dojo to give us the Bible basics about explaining Christ's real presence in the Eucharist. That's going to be loads of fun, as it usually is with Paul. And also Thursday coming up, Jewish convert Roy Showman joins the show and we're going to explore something a really fascinating topic is jesus in the talmud the jewish talmud uh i can't wait to talk to roy about that and explore it like i said the hour is gone it's amazing how much time flies coming up next the terry and jesse show and it's time for me to shut down the midwest man center and turn off the dojo lights i want to thank everybody for listening appreciate it and have a great day In the 1990s, I lived and worked in Hollywood. But when my wife Betty's mom took ill, we relocated to Orange County. And it was during this time in our lives that I converted to Catholicism. Once my eyes were opened to the truth, I couldn't learn enough about the faith. But I had less free time than ever, especially with a long commute. That's when I discovered the real value of Catholic audio. Listening to cassette tapes transformed my daily commute into a miniature retreat. And that's the beauty of Virgin Most Powerful Radio today. 
Since the podcasts are archived, you can listen anytime on our smartphone app. I know how listening to Catholic audio can bring you closer to Christ and His Church, so I encourage you to visit the App Store or go to vmpr.org and download the app today. It just might change your life. I'm Matthew Arnold for Virgin Most Powerful Radio.